creating a culture of love. Are all humans addicts? We're all searching for pleasure and avoiding pain. But I've seen a lot of people with a lot of money, with a lot of issues, and think because they've got wealth or daddy gave them money, they can buy away their problems. We're so easy to judge and cast that stone in saying, I'm not an addict, you're an addict. You know what an engine will do? Like we, you and I, engines. We inspire you, we motivate you, we make you feel good, we lift you up, and we fucking bring the best out of people. We give you the gas, and if that's right. not enough, we start just, pushing. Just keep helping you. <laughs> yeah. I want to see people win. Mike Diamond, welcome to the show, Live Through Love Studios, and we're just going to dive right in. Okay. Are all humans addicts? I believe they are. I believe that uh, part of the human experience, well, I believe we're spiritual beings having a human experience, and we've all got different purposes here, and we're all born in a different place mm -hmm. and time for a reason, and part of that journey is to find ourselves, and I think that the reason I believe we're all addicts is because we're all searching for pleasure and avoiding pain. Mm. Okay. So when you break things down now, my thing was cocaine and my thing was alcohol, right? I I've done the heroin, never really got into it. I, I snort, snorted one line of cocaine. The guy at the gym said, you look like you're sluggish. I was like, I am before pre-workout. He said, have a line of this. I did a line. I said, I need a bag. Yeah. <laughs> it wasn't even a fucking negotiation. Yeah. I was doing eight balls, right? Yeah. So I, I, now when I look at my, in my DNA, both my grandfathers died of alcoholism. Mm -hmm. My dad and my grandmother, both my grandmothers lived to over a hundred, right? Wow. They weren't alcoholic. My dad's a workaholic. Mm. Okay. So anything that you do that I believe the reason I like, say, Buddhism, right? Me personally, I look at a guy like Buddha. He had the pleasure, had the palace. He was exposed to suffering. He got around the suffering. He emaciated himself and said, okay, this is not it. And then he said enlightenment to him was to find the middle ground mm. through love, compassion, right? Being empathetic. And he found that balance. So every day there's different abuse and there's different addictions. Mm -hmm. Some people are addicted to porn. Some people are different to shopping. Now, when you're looking at fentanyl or crack cocaine like I did and snorting coke, yeah, physically, it, it, it bangs you up a lot quicker if you're addicted to meth. Yeah. But I've seen a lot of people with a lot of money, mm -hmm. with a lot of issues and think because they've got wealth or daddy gave mm -hmm. them money, they can buy away their problems. No, but they can't. And that's not the case. Nope. And, and why I asked that question is I truly believe we are all addicts. I think if you say, hey, you're an addict, and I'm not talking about you actually owning it, but someone's going to be like, take offense to that. What? I'm not addicted. I'm like, you're addicted to something. Yeah. For, for a point in my life, I used fitness to escape my depression, to escape how unhappy I was in life, and that was my addiction. Or... I love movies or I love this. And it's, it's addiction to me. Maybe it's how would you define addiction, first of all, but we could be addicted to love. Correct. Right? And yep. I think it's how we're wired. It's a survival instinct. So I'm not saying it in the aspect of it's a bad thing. I think we're so easy to judge and cast that stone in saying, I'm not an addict, you're an addict. Yeah, and I think you just know it's a stigma. I can't be an addict. Do you know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. But I always say to people, if you're not an addicted to things, be a minimalist. Strip it all down. Yeah. Really strip it down to nothing. I go to places like, you know, the south of France, right? And and like there's a there's a we went there just recently and it, it I love going there because it's so simple. The food, I ate like a pig, I got colitis, pizzas, <laughs> burgers, octopus Lots styles, of cheeses, right? right? Nothing happened. My stomach was... I actually went to a bathroom. I went to a guy. I said, look, if I ate this pizza, my name's Mike Diamond. In, in LA, there's a plumber called Mike Diamond. I may need to do plumbing on your place. <laughs> like I could blow the back end out of this place. He goes, you'll be fine. Even my wife said, she goes, you don't have stomach issues here. Because yeah. the food, right? Mm -hmm. 
Because what do we do here? We're addicted to sugar. Yeah. We're addicted to processing. We're addicted to fast. Flavor. Flavor. The chemistry ah, and the flavor. Right? I walk in, I have breadsticks and oil there, all the seed oil things, all this, right? We're addicted to the next novelty. You know mm -hmm. why? Because we want to spike a dopamine. Mm -hmm. And that's the American way. I mean, I live here, but it's true. And I don't want to talk about the food industry, but they are purposely making us, knowing that we are addicts, be more addicted to the smell, to the taste. Half the time, I'm not even hungry. My tongue wants it. My yeah. tongue wants that extra chip or that cookie or whatever. And like, let's look at how we're always looking at that in everything we're doing. Even self-help, we get addicted to that. The next podcast book, everything. guru. So then you say, can you sit in the silence alone in the dark? Can you sit by yourself in the stillness mm. and just be okay with being okay? Most. That's the key. That's the hardness. Yeah. And regulating your mood. So we're all addicted to something. Mm -hmm. But are you brave enough to look at yourself in the mirror and know where you're flawed and then work on it daily? Right? Because every day is a reset. Yeah. It's you a paint. new day. It says that right, right there right. behind But you. you paint, right? Yeah. You never paint again. Who gives a fuck? Right? You have to paint every day. It's mm -hmm. the process. No one wants to do the process. Mm -hmm. No one wants to do the work. No, we want the results. We want the end game. We want the accolade. That's where we're addicts. <laughs> yeah. We're addicted to the win, mm -hmm. right? Everyone wants the trophy, but no one wants to train. No, but the fruits are in the journey. Always. And I have to constantly remind myself, trust the process, enjoy the journey. Yeah. And that's the hard part. That's where the lessons are. Yeah, it's great. You know, last year I did this cool thing with the NFL, but it's like everything that led up to that point and I even think back as all the work I did prior to getting that email and saying yes and be able to do the project, because if I hadn't done the work to know where I'm going to make this actually happen a year before, I wouldn't have been able to make it happen at that point. And that's part of the journey and the process and everything so that you can actually then celebrate in the win, but you still have to do the work to get there. Yeah, and I don't think you're supposed to know. I think that's the problem. I think we're... That's why there's so much stuff that's that's sold to people and it's bullshit. And that's why social media has messed people up mm -hmm. is because the work required is personal and mastery is individual. And mastery after a while is boring mm -hmm. because you any skill, okay, you start off as you're unconscious and you're incompetent right you don't know what you don't know mm -hmm. then you become consciously incompetent now you're like there's a lot of shit i've got to learn that's hard and messy most people want the quick fix mm -hmm. now if you can work through hard and messy you don't know how long it's going to take you become consciously competent mm. right now you're consciously competent and most people take the full off the gas you have to become unconsciously competent before you get into a state of flow. And that takes years. Mm. That it's an ingrained habit in the subconscious that when you need to call it, it's second nature. So that's why guys like Larry Bird, for example, he couldn't jump like magic and he wasn't as fast. And people mm -hmm. like Kobe used to laugh at him. But he had unconscious competence that he knew he would do a thousand three throws or whatever while you weren't at practice. So he knew when there was three seconds on the clock, he would laugh and go, give me the ball. Yeah. I'll throw it over your head. Because he knew doing the unconscious competent work, it didn't matter the audience. Mm -hmm. Now that's the work people don't want to do. Because you can't buy that in a can. Mm -mm. You can't buy it by your followers. It's the ability to sit in the present moment by yourself. Like we say, do the work in the dark, you yeah. shine in the bright lights. And that's hard. And that takes time mm -hmm. and that takes discipline, right? And that takes commitment, consistency, dedication. Quieting the inner critic. Oh, the that's self the doubt. Yeah. The, you know, to take as a gym example, you're running laps and you're way ahead, let's say. And you're like, ah, you know what? Let me shorten this one. I'm so far ahead. I could take my foot off the gas. So what you were saying when you're competent, but sometimes I think when we take the foot off there, we end up just mediocre. Yeah. Average average but that's because we're we're subsiding to our own it's not that someone's holding us down the man isn't holding me down i'm holding me down i'm saying this is enough 
Yeah, and I think that's why like, I told people I didn't have mentors growing up, right? I left Australia with nothing. I was born in Perth, Western Australia, the most isolated capital city in the world. Mm. Undiagnosed dyslexic with ADHD, right? I had a dream of coming to America. Everyone laughed at me. Could barely pass school, right? But I could, I was photograph. I was a great athlete as a kid and I was photographic in visual. So by complete fluke, I discovered I was really good at like theater and acting mm. because I was sitting in the back of a chorus of a play and I didn't want to do the play because I was playing sports and doing stuff and I thought it was stupid. It was the Pied Piper. And I was in the back with a kid joking around, being an ass. I was like 12, 11 or 12. Mm -hmm. And I would remember everyone's parts and to make him laugh in rehearsals, I would say the parts to him. Three kids got the flu. Two of the lead males. Then there was one lead male. And they said, we can't do the play because no one can do the part. It was two weeks, no, two days before. Yeah. And the kid next to me ratted me out and said, Mike knows the parts. And I was like, no, I don't. Now, the only reason I admitted I knew them was the track coach was running everything. She said, look, do you really know the parts? I was like, yeah. She's like, how? I'm like, I just remember them. She's like, how do you remember them? I said, I don't know. She's like, get up and sing the songs and do the part. And I'm like, okay. And I bang out a couple of numbers and then she goes, okay. And what happened is I didn't know this till later. I was never afraid in front of people. Mm. I never got stage fright. So I got up and loved it and it clicked. I was like, I can get out of Perth. That was your moment. So I would catch the bus, work in a grocery store. No one believed in me, pay for my acting classes to a point that kids would come in and laugh at me while I was packing groceries, like calling me a loser. Like, what are you doing? I'm like, going to acting school. And then when I graduated from high school, after I got kicked out of one, went to the other, I went straight to the East Coast and went to acting school. And then I just worked. In New York? No, I, w I ended up in Sydney first, in Australia. Had a horrible, I didn't understand my alcoholism. Mm. See, I was drinking at 12. But the first time I was drunk, my grandmother got me drunk at four. And I nearly- Wait, wait, wait. Yeah. Your grandmother Grand got you drunk at yeah. four? Yeah, you want to you talk about fucked up? Got me drunk at four with her friend and for years, my parents blamed me. But, okay, so got you like an accident? Like <laughs> no. here, have a drink or like- I nearly died drunk. of alcohol poisoning. I can Damn. still remember throwing up and shooting myself at four and years old. how the hell old. can that be your problem? Right? And years later, I went, went and saw my parents and they would joke about it. And I said to my little brother, how old's my nephew? Is it four? And I'm like, I want- mom and dad to get him drunk and he looked at me i was like why it's fun right and we can just blame him and the whole family had a moment of like oh wait a four-year-old can't control an adult and i had to have a long conversation with my mom and say that's child abuse you understand that you're fucking you're out of your mind yeah like my mom just recently she's out of her mind don't understand she's like i was so envious at you when you'd win track medals and would do all your things and go to acting school and i'm like How? what my my son takes a shit and my wife wraps it in gold <laughs> and i had to like get a little hard on him I'm like dude dude you're not that special it's just shit yeah. like you wiped your ass today but seriously like i've got a she's such a great mother yeah where i didn't ha i didn't i i never got never got love by it from either parent no, not either parent, mm -hmm. neither one of my parents will buy one of my books. I've got two books out. They still ask me if I have a job. <laughs> I'm being dead serious. But that's why I'm so good with troubled youth. That's why I'm so loving and kind because I was abused so much. So you turn, you turn that neglect, that abuse, the the language and not knowledge of not being able to receive love and experience love into a superpower. Yeah, because you know why? It feels fucked. So why do I want to be a dick to someone else? I'm the opposite. Like if, if, if all my life people told me I sucked and I go around knowing how shitty that feels, mm -hmm. I'm not going to tell someone they suck. I'm, there's two types of people, right? I call them engines and anchors. An anchor will hold you down like an anchor and try to drown Oof, you. Ball and chain. Right? 
You know what an engine will do? Like we, you and I, engines. We inspire you. We motivate you. We make you feel good. We lift you up. And we fucking bring the best out of people. We give you the gas. And if that's right. not enough, we start just, pushing. Just keep <laughs> helping you. Yeah. How, I want to see people win. Because I've got friends that are dead that, that didn't make it out. But I've got friends that grew up with me to this day that they'll be like, I grew up when I was five or six. They're like, you still message us. And we're going through hell. I said, yeah, I'm, not the, I'm the same person. Mm -hmm. I just figured out how to crack the code. If I'm a good person and I bring good in the world, the universe always takes care mm -hmm. of me. The yeah, there's always. also a lesson in a moment there. It doesn't mean in the past those demons don't haunt you. Oh, they haunt me. It's just that we now start learning the language and the tools or recognizing what's happening, that we can start snapping out of it, move forward, ignoring it. But not ignoring it like it doesn't exist. More like, hey, I don't need to hear you right now. Yep. You look, I say to people this really simply, if you're dealing with a traumatic event, I'll give you a perfect example. Where were you September 11th? I was sleeping in bed. The alarm rings and big boy Power 106 is on the radio. And I hear that someone just crashed into these towers in New York. Remember it straight away, right? Okay, I was there watching the towers come down in my apartment in the East Village. Like, oh, I always imagine like what it would have been like. To, oh. Yeah, I was watching it like from my thing, right? That will never change. What changes is how it affects me now through time. Mm. So what I tell people is when you're triggered because a traumatic event, what, because you straight away, it's the heightened sensory. Now, if I said what happened 10 days after that, you'd be like, I don't fucking know. We'd have to think about it, right? So if you've been sexually abused, mentally abused, physically abused over the years, the trauma stays wired, neurons that fire together, wire together, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, so if something comes in, right, it's coming in, stimulus is coming in, I'm triggered. It could be a song, it could be a smell. You don't know what's in the wiring that's going to trigger it, okay? And you sit in it. It's, I'd say to people very simply, What's the worst movie you've ever seen? Give you an example. What's the worst movie or song that you hate, you fucking despise? I, well, you said movie. I already popped Perfect. it in my head. The movie Alexander is the you hate longest. I wa that was the only movie I wanted right. to walk out Perfect. of. Perfect. In real time, in real time right now, as deep as we're going to fucking get, all that matters is this moment. I am sitting here on a podcast with you. I can't change the past. We can't fast forward time. Mm -hmm. We are here. If I tell you to think about Alexander the movie, it has to be a memory of the movie. Mm -hmm. You have to put the picture in your mind to trigger the emotion. So what is trauma? It's a memory. It's a movie yeah. that we keep playing over and over again, right? So if we get better at reframing the movie, mm -hmm. so there's a technique called storm that I use. You stop when you're triggered, T, Take a breath, but breathe diaphragmatically. It may take eight to 10 deep breaths. Some mm -hmm. people use box breathing. Oh, observe. What is the trauma? What is the event? What triggered it? Mm -hmm. Now, ah, reframe it. Reframe it in reality. Am I safe right this second? Mm. Is it just a movie I'm playing over and over my head? Because... A tra real trauma, like it's not September 11th, but it could trigger me or that person said something that reminds me of someone that abused me, but I'm not actually physically being abused. It's the trauma that's being yeah. replayed, right? Yeah. That's a real check-in. Now, M, make the change, right? So if you get better at stopping, taking a breath, observing, reframing, and then moving forward, right? It's the practice of, oh, I'm triggered, I'm going to observe it in real time. Okay, I'm okay. I can reframe it, right? I'm not that person anymore. I can mm -hmm. set boundaries. Wow, I'm, I'm, I'm aware of my emotions. Now I'm going to make the change and move forward. Over time, you get better at reframing those traumatic events. You don't try to push them away. You don't try to push them down. You sit in them and you reframe them. Mm. I love the, the acronym because the storm is coming. It's That's like why. a storm. That's why I call it yeah. storm. You're caught in the storm. Yeah. And you've got to sit in the eye sometimes and let it pass. And, and I do want to dive into one thing here because a lot of people think, again, like that first question, what is an addict? What is trauma? Because some of us believe, oh, it's sexually abused. That was beat. Uh, I grew up in an alcoholic family or this. 
it doesn't have to be any of that, you know? It, it could be stuff. Everyone has trauma that experiences themselves. It's just, I didn't receive love. I didn't get hugs as a kid. That's trauma as yes. a kid. And we don't realize these things, especially sometimes men can be like, ah, oh, suck it up, toughen up, right? Doesn't it's work. not easy to be vulnerable no. and affectionate and sensitive. I remember growing up, I was too sensitive. I'm still too sensitive. I'm like, oh, you get butthurt for everything. I'm like, yeah, I take it on. I take it emotionally. So my thing is don't take it personally. That's a different one of the four agreements. But yeah, I think it's if we could allow people to stop putting so much judgment, weight, and definitions on what is addiction, what is trauma, what is abuse, what is you name however you want to define it, and start realizing we're all humans. Yeah. We all want love. <laughs> we all bleed. We all hurt. <laughs> And let's just go there. And then let's start adding the other things. To no, it. you said it beautifully. I'll tell you why. I don't know your trauma and I never judge a person's past. I don't know what they've experienced. I don't know what their perceptual fil filters are. Like they say, the map is in the territory. Mm -hmm. Okay. You can look at a map of New York, right? But you go to New York, you get a different experience. Totally. Okay. That's why they say the food is not the menu, right? You could look at the uh, cheeseburger but until you bite into the cheeseburger and knowing how you're wired through your DNA, mm -hmm. you're going to taste it different to me. So I always say to this, like, you know what they say, suck it up, harden up. I'm like, no, no, that doesn't work. I deal with addicts. They're, 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 you're sensitive. That makes you a great artist. You can't be a great artist unless you take things a little personal and you're mm -hmm. sensitive. It's just the fucking way it works. Mm -hmm. You see something, you take it personal, you have to put it out in the world. Yeah, That's great art. No all people, look, I always say Robert Downey Jr. went from crackhead to Iron Man. Right or wrong? He was. True. He was facts. fucking crack and then he went to Iron Man. Yeah. That's, that's reframing it. So when people make the comment about, for example, this younger generation is sensitive and this younger generation is like incompetent or, you know, uh, what do you call it? Lacks discipline, all this bullshit. I'm like, oh, hold on, hold on. In 2017, my appendix burst. I was told I had a 1% chance of making it through without taking my colon out, mm. right? Because I have ulcerated colitis. I didn't take my colon out. Heal myself naturally. A year and a half, my baby came seven weeks premature. I pushed my baby in the stroller to get my, to heal back. I was told I was never run again. Ran one half marathon a year after that. Ran 30 in 30 days. Damn. With a hernia and colitis. So, Okay. If you can't do what I can do with colitis, you're lazy. See, does it matter now? No. What's the fucking baseline? Running like David Goggins every day with the trauma he has is not the baseline. No. I personally love his story. Yes. I don't have an issue with him. But you don't run until your feet are mangled, right? And do what he's done, right? Mm -hmm. He's not telling people to do, do what he does. No, he not. admits it. He's like, I do this shit. I like him personally because me, I'm like, damn, the guy went through all that racism, failed buds three times. It was huge, overweight, yeah. and became so this I athlete. love him for that reason. Yeah. I am empathetic to the trauma he suffered because most people won't make it out. And what people don't get is that that's how he keeps himself motivated, like stay hard. I've got to stay hard. That's his thing. Yeah. Right? So it's like he's not going – He does, it's just people get it wrong. You can't scream at people. No one likes to be screamed at. And if you choose – to go into a Navy SEAL program, like I've got friends in Navy SEALs, it's a choice. Mm -hmm. They know what they're going into. They're going in to get starved, beaten down and bullied. And become one of the best warriors on this planet. On this planet, special forces. They're yeah. savages for a reason. But the rest of the world, everyone's got trauma. Mm -hmm. Events are, are traumatic to different people. I know people that never got abused and beaten, but the way their siblings were beaten made them afraid of violence and they're traumatized for the rest of their yeah. life, right? They never physically were beaten, but they saw so much abuse growing up, they're traumatized. Yeah. So it's not, we all, it's just, we're all different and we've got to give, we've got to meet people where they're at. We've got to be kind, loving, compassionate, empathetic and shut the fuck up with like, there's no right way. No. If you're a good person, that's the right way. Yeah, and what, what that's... Well said. It's like, let's just be gentle. Gentle, kind. And what I'm always saying is like, can't we just realize that 
you're a human, I'm a human. Let's start there. We forget all that. Right now we add all these labels and all these other things. And I'm like, we're constantly dividing ourselves, creating these walls. Oh, I'm an abused person. So like, why are you telling me that now? Why can't you say I'm a human? Let's learn each other. Oh, hey, I can relate to that. That happened to me too. Like you start getting to that. Now we start creating empathy, yes. compassion. We actually yes. become friends. But now we, we block that off and we, we're kind of surface friends. Yeah, because it's all fear. It's mm -hmm. all fear. I don't have it. Look, someone said to me the other day, they were like the, the, about the gender thing. And I was like, it's a spiritual being having a human experience. I don't know what they're going through. I'm just going to. And I'm not going to pretend I understand either. But I don't. I don't know what you're feeling. How can I how can I meet you where you're at? And I don't have an issue with like pronouns. I'm like, well, I just tell me how you like to be spoken to and I'll work with that. Mm -hmm. That's not, it doesn't affect, I go home and I lay straight in bed. I pay my own fucking bills and I'm kind to people. <laughs> and if I see someone with a struggle, I'm help them. It doesn't bother me. It it's doesn't affect my life. I'm not going to be belittled people. I was belittled all my life. It's mm -hmm. where, where, Do you need a hand up? No problem. How can I? Look, we're all trying to close the gap from where we are to where we want to be. Yeah. In whatever we do, right? How can I do that with love and kindness? That's it. That should be the only question. That's why I say live through love. That's why right? I say choose love. That's it. How can I do it? I'm stuck here. No problem. I have mm -hmm. a little bit of information here. I've got a friend that's got more information. All right, you're an artist, right? If I've got a young addict that's struggling an artist, I'm going to call you. I don't, I'm not, you paint, right? He's struggling. Where do I start? Mm -hmm. Start with the basics. Perfect. I gather the right mentors. I gather the right people to help. That's it. Mm -hmm. And then you don't learn things unless it takes time. Yeah. And good mentors and people coaching you. And when you want to quit, because most of the time you don't want to get out of bed and you don't want to do it. And I always say, successful people in anything you do, do the work no matter how they feel. Mm -hmm. Unsuccessful people want to feel good, feel right, and looking for the right time. Yeah. There is no time. There is now. Show up. Be consistent. That's it. Day in, day out. That's it. Right? Everything starts with one. Why? You want to write a book? It's the first word. You want to run a marathon? It's the first step. You want to come down? It's the first breath, right? It's always the first step mm -hmm. forward. And sometimes just pause. Just stay. And regather yourself. And guess what? Every 24 hours to reset anyway. And some days are a tax write-off. Just <laughs> fucking throw them away. But don't judge yourself. Like no. today I'm just going to Netflix and binge no. my face off. Cool. That's what I chose to do. I think if we start owning our choices, then we put less judgment on ourselves and like, we can have a fuck off day. I call yeah. it a case of the fuck. It's whether you eat it, you drink it, you whatever it is you're doing. But so what? You chose that, yeah. Look, someone said the other day and, and they got upset with me. They're like, isn't discipline freedom? And I said, well, hold on. I have to discipline myself in my life because I live in the industrial world of America to be successful as an author, as an interventionist. Yes, it gives me freedom because I set boundaries. But if I lived in fucking Nice... Would discipline be freedom? I'm free as a motherfucker in Nice. I'm getting up when I want. Mm -hmm. I'm walking down the street. I know I don't have to compete with everyone. Yeah. You see what I'm saying? So, yes, it gives you freedom and you have to discipline yourself mm -hmm. when you're competing. But over when you're in a place like that, there's no competition. Like, that's why it's like the indigenous people had it right. Like, just live off the land, right? Mm -hmm. But. It doesn't work like so yes it it is yes i have to discipline myself to give my freedom to set boundaries but on the other case is like some people are like what are you doing dude mm -hmm. what are you yeah but yeah. freedom is a result yes correct so what happens if we're only chasing freedom what happens in between what's what are then we you're all stressed yeah so here's another thing we live in america right what's the one thing that americans are, are dying of what kills Amer more Americans? Anything. What's the number one killer? Well, there's a few, but as far as... Really the top one. Think about it. Well, stress. Stress. Why? Because we want more. Always. Because right? we're enamored with capitalism. Always. So because what is it? Avoid pain, gain, pleasure. So what do we do? 
We take a pill to crush the pain, uh, to avoid it, to continue to chase <laughs> the illusion of freedom and wealth and all these other things. And then what? guess what? One day we do get filthy rich, but I'm dying on a deathbed with diabetes and pre-stroke. I'm having three bypasses and I can't play with my grandkids. So you know what I always tell people at the end of the day? Doing the right thing isn't easy. Doing the easy thing isn't right. Okay? Get all the billionaires in the world. There's like 2,650 billionaires, and I think it's a net worth of $126 trillion. Okay? Line them up against me. Face our creator. See how good a negotiator you are now. Why? You take fucking nothing with you. Everything's for rent. The body's for rent. Everything. Everything is for rent. Okay? Mm -hmm. The purpose of this experience is to find out your purpose, be your value, and leave things in people, right, that helps them reach their potential, find peace and love, and be better people. Yeah. We can't have this much money and abundance in the world and so much poverty. It's silly. It's so lopsided. It's, it's so silly. It's not love. No. And I'm not saying go make billions and give it all away. This isn't what I'm talking about either. No. But let's be engines for everybody. Exactly. But it's funny what you just brought up. I remember when I was in finance or real estate, all I wanted to do was like, I need to get a billionaire because if I'm their, their guy, then I'm going to be rich too. Yeah. And then, you know, we're always chasing that. But now, living in my purpose, I hang out with more billionaires. I got a few texts. I could just text billionaires now. It's the, And I don't say that as an ego no. thing. I'm saying it from the moment of what you just said. Because some of them, and from these conversations, they, want, they don't have what I have. Or what I've created. They have money and they have all that. But, like, what can we do together now? And I'm able to do some really cool things with people that have means... Now we can amplify a message and move forward. So don't look at that as evil is what I'm ultimately saying. I mean, there's good in every position of where we're at. And how do we start? Yeah, and it's, I always like this. If, you, if you're taking a shortcut, look, the most important thing is your intention, right? You're making a positive intention. Don't cut corners. Like if you have a great product and you're like, and then someone says, you know, but you could sell a million of them and help a million people, but you're going to kill a million things by making the product because you're skimping on the packaging. Do the right fucking packaging. Mm -hmm. Right? And that's the problem. Use a better t-shirt. Right. It, no, it sounds stupid, but it's true. It's like those shortcuts. We live in shortcuts because we think we're going to arrive at this place and feel better, but you never arrive. It's destination mm -hmm. disease. You're always working. You're always climbing. Mm -hmm. Top of one mountain, bottom of the next. Just another day. Just another moment. That's what they say. You sleep, sweep the floor once, you have a dirty floor. Right? So you've just got to be a good person and show up, have empowering. And another thing that people need to stop doing as well is don't worry. I get up. I tell people is this. I get up between three or four in the morning. Me, because I read, I meditate, I stretch, right? I write because I write books. And I don't know how much time I need with myself because I used to get in at four in the morning and I'm a fucking nut job and I have crazy energy. Mm -hmm. I could do eight balls of co cocaine and go to the gym every day. Like, I'm a freak, but it's in my DNA. Both my grandmothers lived to 100. Yeah. So I'm wired like a honey badger. So I know <laughs> I need to spend four hours by myself sometimes. But I don't tell other people, if you can get up at seven and you feel great and you've got a great life and you're a great family person and you're bringing great into the world, get up at fucking seven. It's none of my business. I need it. I know me. Mm -hmm. I know where I'm flawed. I got up the other day. I've had to stretch so much trauma out of my body physically, right? Mental abuse, physical abuse. There was some sexual abuse that came up through a trauma therapist. And it's taken me, I stretch probably an hour a day, right? Mm -hmm. 30 minutes in the morning, 30 minutes the night. I've ch had to change the way I, I exercise. I was running so much. I got COVID three times and shingles writing this book, Dose of Positivity. Damn. My buddy got COVID and he got shingles. So shingles is the worst fucking... I got... Uh, for those that don't know, it's basically adult chicken pox. Basically. But here's the best thing. I go to my wife. Oh, I think I got bitten by a spider. And she's yeah. like, what? Right? My leg was fucked, right? So after a leg workout, like an idiot. So I go to the doctor and he's like, oh, you got bitten by the shingle spider. I go, oh, there's a fucking shingle spider. He goes, you got shingles, you idiot. <laughs> but the problem was the medication gave me a stomach infection. So here's this. It's a true fucking story. I send in, I send in the book. It gets approved by the um, publisher. I've got to get the edits back. 
I'm, I'm in the bathroom 20 times a day, sometimes more because of my colitis. I can't hold anything down. Mm-hmm. The meds are blowing out my stomach from the shingles. I've got to stop them. I've got shingles. I've got a stomach infection. And COVID. And, and COVID. And then I'm writing and the book's called A Dose of Positivity. And I'm like, this is my fucking karma. I've got to find the positivity in this. So when I tell people when you're going through this stuff, this is when you need indirect mentors. And one of my favorite indirect mentors is Viktor Frankl. Mm. Man's Search for Meaning. I was like, that guy was in a concentration camp and found love, found positivity, found joy and wasn't resentful. Mm. So I just literally transport my brain and go, okay, I'm sitting there Victor Frankl right now. What would he say? He'd be like, Mike, you got a book deal. I know. It's a little rough on your stomach, but you're going to get through this. Mm. I was in a fucking concentration camp, buddy. Hitler's not banging on the door. You're in sunny California. Okay, you got the runs. Yeah. Okay, your leg's blown out, right? Finish the chapter. And I literally would rewire myself mm. by telling myself that's what a great inter- mentor will tell you. Like, mm. I know you're going through it. And there's another one called uh, General Stockdale. General Stockdale was in a prisoner of war camp for seven years. I've heard of and it. And it's brilliant. It's called the Stockdale Paradox. And he said, they said to him and they interviewed him, were you optimistic and positive in the prisoner of war camp? He said, no, I'm going to teach you something. The people that were too optimistic and positive would say, you know, we're going to get out by Christmas, going to get out by Christmas, right? They didn't get out by Christmas. They died. They lost faith. He goes, and hope, he goes, you've just got to have faith You'll get through the moments. And that's brilliant. See, it's mm. being, and he got through seven years in a prisoner of war camp and he's a big lecturer now. And the point is I tell people is that when my stomach's blown out, I'm just going to have faith. I'm just going to get through the next moment. I would go three hours and not use the bathroom and think it was a miracle. I'm like, I didn't use the bathroom for three hours. That's a win. Right. And then my stomach would gurgle. I'm like, uh oh, right. Or I'd get through a paragraph and send it to my editor and he goes, this is amazing. I'm like, yes. But that's how you have to literally mm-hmm. slow it down. And then celebrate the little wins and the little moments and microscopic sometimes. I mean, it has to be microscopic. And then when you get through it and you look back, you're like, it was worth every bit of it. It taught it gave me character. You know, it taught me resilience. It taught me I can mm-hmm. I can suffer anything now. And that's the key. Yeah. And that's it's simple. And it's true, because if you look at just the thing about positivity. Because right now there's there's a lot of talk around toxic positivity, right? And a lot of that is basically we're lying to ourselves. We're like, I'm using positivity to lie to myself that X, Y, Z is happening. Well, you know why? I'll tell you why. It's like this thing, okay? Remember the secret? Mm-hmm. Okay. What did the secret say? Ask, believe, you'll receive. Bullshit. I'll tell you why. Ask, I want to lose 100 pounds. Believe, I believe I can lose 100 pounds. I don't get off the fucking couch and do anything. Can't I it. should be 100 pounds lighter. <clears throat> ask, I believe I want to lose 100 pounds. No, sorry, ask, I want to lose 100 pounds. Believe, I believe I can. Three, take massive action in alignment with what I want to receive. Mm-hmm. Four, the universe will give me what I'm going to receive. Yeah. So what people, the reason it's toxic, it's called optimistic delusional. You can't do anything you set your mind to. That doesn't work. Mm -mm. You know why? That guy sued Red Bull. Red Bull said it gives you wings. He jumped out of a building. He said it didn't give me fucking wings, right? That's called optimistic delusional, right? He sued him for 10 million and one. I cannot tell you. I am going to play no matter how much I want to manifest, no matter how much I tell you I'm the best, like Michael Jordan. Mm -hmm. It's not going to fucking happen. So that's like toxic positivity, right? Telling you, yes, you can, you can. No, there is reality. Some things you can't do. It doesn't matter how hard I work. I am never going to be as good as you as an artist. We have toxic positivity and we have delusion when we don't have purpose and we're looking at everyone else's journey Right, and comparing our journey with someone else's because we don't know who we are mm-hmm. and we're not being authentic. Right? Yeah. So yeah. as soon as you slow the fuck down and look at yourself and say, who am I really? Like deep down, who am I? And if I'm trying to be a people pleaser for someone else, why? Why? Then it's not toxic. Because that's their dose. There you go. Reba, 
Avoid pain, gain pleasure. Mm -hmm. Dopamine, oxytocin, serotonin, and endorphins. Mm -hmm. We're all searching for the dose. That's interesting. No one asked. My first mural says, who will I be? I wrote that question on my first mural and then put all these other words, which was the antithesis of what I was thinking when I was depressed and, you know, I'm unworthy. I'm put, who am I? I'm worthy. Uh, what was me? Victim, victim, responsible leader. Like, I just put those words and it's reframing, reframing. Everything's then, reframing. But now I think people ask, you know, who am I? I am living to be my most authentic self. Well, what is that? Being me. Well, what is that? What do we? Well, I'm being authentic. Well, define authentic. It's a buzzword, yeah, right? It's so like culture. People are like, it's all about culture. Well, what's your culture? I'll give you a little trick here, okay? And people don't get this. And I love telling, it changes everyone's. Like people talk about values, right? Mm -hmm. And they have all these, these spin words. I'm like, okay, I'll give you a perfect example of where you're fucking up. They're like, why? And I'm like, do you value fun? They're like, yeah. And I'm like, perfect. I was like, it'll tell you a little story. I valued fun. What's your rule to it? They're like, I never thought of that. It's like, okay. My rule to fun years ago was coming in at four in the morning, snorting coke, drinking, and getting fucking crazy. And there was a girl when I owned this club, and she asked me out on a date. And I said, awesome. We went on the first date, and she said, tomorrow I'm going to get up and run a marathon. I said, what? She goes, it's fun. I thought, this bitch is out of her fucking mind. <laughs> it's going to kill me. Yeah. Right? I would come in railed out of my mind. I didn't mean to say bitch, but I'm saying back then I was like, what the fuck, right? Mm -hmm. And I was like, this is not fun. I can't date this girl. She's running marathons. I'm doing blow. Same value, fun, different rule. Now I get sober, right? I have friends that call me up. You want to party? I'm like, dude, I get up, I meditate, I run marathons. <laughs> That's fun. <laughs> Same value, different rule. Yeah. So I tell people, what are your values? Okay, that. What is the rule? Give me another example. Two people have the value of respect. But what's the rule? One person feels respected when they get more money. The other person feels respected when they get more status. They both work for a great person. The person keeps giving them pay rises. One person's disgruntled, the other person's happy. They're both sitting at a bar a year later, having a chat because they love the work environment, but one's frustrated. It's like, you know, really, I'm gonna quit. Like, why? Well, he, he always rewards us. He's like, what do you mean? He's like, he keep giving us more money. He's like, I don't need more money. I wanna be a manager. Mm -hmm. He's like, well, did you ever tell him you wanna be a manager? He goes, no, he should know. Ah. So instead of being a fucking mind reader, right? Know what your values are when you're dealing with someone, mm -hmm. but know the rules. So my wife, for example, likes places over people. I love people over places. I love the vibe, the people's, right? She loves fucking Paris. I hate Paris. I like the decor. I don't like the people. I just don't like the people. They're rude. I don't like rude people. I lived in New York. I like flow. So we make a compromise. I go, if we're going to go to Paris... We have to go to Nice because I love the people. Yeah. Right? We're happy. Why? Because she knows how I, she doesn't like Rome. I like Rome. I like the people. I like the history. I like history. She doesn't. So she may like Florence. So if we're going to do Rome, we're going to do Florence. Mm. And that's how we work our values yeah. and rules. We're different. Fun to her isn't getting up at four in the morning like me. That's crazyville. She mm -hmm. thinks I'm a maniac. She doesn't bother me. But guess what? When the baby was young, I would take the baby for four hours and run him in the stroller. She'd get four hours of sleep. It's a win-win. She's stoked. She's like, this motherfucker can get up at four because I got four hours of sleep and no postpartum. Do you see what I'm saying? Yeah. So you've got to understand the values and rules. And once you can play by the same values and rules, oh, you can do anything together. But you also have to be clear, communicate those so parameters. Clear. Exactly. It's and passing the ball back and forth. Talk. Why are you frustrated? I'm frustrated about this. Why? That's why when people say, I'm living my best self or I'm being authentic. And I've seen people tell me this all the time. And I was like, yeah, that's not your inclination. It's like the podcast world, right? COVID hit. People couldn't leave their houses. So people got a podcast. It's not like this beautiful studio. So what do they do? Everyone's like, I need money. So they pay people. 
And then people bought press. Why? Because people didn't have jobs. You have these bunch of people now with podcasts, right? Made up these phony resumes that have all these celebrities on their podcasts. Why? Because people want to get paid. You start to do a track record. Where did this person come from? They came from nowhere. Mm -hmm. Right? Because Mm -hmm. it's just... Is that being authentic? It can't last. That's the key word there. It can't last. Maybe it started authentic. Maybe the idea was... But are you truly executing in that capacity? No. And that's when things run out. Are you really bringing value to people? That's the difference. And you know when you get around people. You've been around. You were born here. You've been in fights. End of story. I can mm-hmm. see it on you. <laughs> I know people that have been in fights. Yeah. I know if there's a fight, oh, I'm like, you're going to got my back. I've been in tons of fights. Mm-hmm. I lived in the bar business. I grew around crazy people. You get around someone and they're the toughest guy at the barbecue. And then you get around someone that's a UFC fighter. I've got UFC friends. They'll snap your neck like a chicken. They're no joke. I've trained with like serious, serious savages. Mm -hmm. You get around people that talk, right, in business. You're like, you haven't done it, man. It's okay. It's okay, but don't. Come on. You you smell it. Your spider senses go up and go, oh, come on, Pinocchio. Yeah. You know what I say to a lot of those people when things come up? Like, oh, I could take your brand to here. I could do this. I'm like, we'll see. We'll see. And it doesn't hurt either party. It's like, we'll see. If you show up and it actually happens, cool. If you don't show up and it doesn't happen, cool. That, that alleviates expectation hangover. But you know the best thing I do with people? Giving someone benefit of the doubt. It's true. You know what I like? I learned the hard way. Any agent that I've ever had, the one I got now I'm working with is amazing, that is too busy telling me what they're going to do and giving me contracts in my past has never come through. And then I get an agent that's just like, I don't know. I like you. How about we don't sign a contract? Let me see what I can do first. (laughs) They always fucking make it work. They always. Because they have to. They have to show up. But they don't. They're they're not trying to fucking piss in my pocket. Mm -hmm. And then these other people I've had sign a year contract with you. They do nothing. You're waiting around and they they gaslight you. They tell you, just tell me if you can't. Just leave it open. But they don't want you to go anywhere else. And then you end up doing it for yourself. You're like, whatever, dude. It's okay. Mm -hmm. But when someone says to me, I don't know. I'd rather, I don't know. Let me just try. They always come through. It's like, I don't know, but I want to fight for you. Give me the chance. Try. Give me a shot. Right. Just let me see what I can do. They always come with deals. Mm-hmm. They pull magic out of their ass. You know, like this person really believes in me. Not the person that says, oh, yeah, 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 It's like cocaine talk I used to have back in the in the club business. Like, oh, I'm going to do this shit. I'm going to make, oh, talking. And then the next day you call him, you're like, I said that. <laughs> <laughs> God, it was good cocaine. Fuck. Ooh, at least you did it in the heydays. Oh, yeah, I did it when there's no social media. Yeah. You know I'm Colombian, so there's oh. this. I actually got some some real pure stuff years ago and in Miami from this guy. And I thought I was like uh, John Travolta with Eric Stoltz in Pulp Fiction. I was like, dude, this. And he's like, this is the madman. And he's like, I'll take your Amsterdam shit. I did a line of this. <laughs> oh, fuck. I went back to this party. I was like, dude, the coke's really strong. I'm gonna drink like 30 Coronas to get the edge off. Like if I did like a shoelace thinking I was like Tommy Mo- Oh dude. <laughs> Tommy Montana. Fucking ripped my back teeth out. I was like, oh shit. Wow. Yeah, no, the, the pure was like straight up. He's like, and he was he was so calm. He's like, I'm just telling you, man. Mm-hmm. Was he in Miami? He goes, this shit's pure. And I'm like, yeah, pure back in red. Never again will I look at someone like that. I was like, dude, people don't know what they don't know. Oh no, dude. It's a whole other level. You know, here here's a, a question around that because you're very cl- straightforward, like cocaine. That was my thing. Let's talk about the people with l- legal drugs, right? Adderall, the worst. And they're like, yeah, but my doctor prescribes it. <laughs> I'm like, you're judging someone for doing a line, and uh, you're uh, as close to almost crushing your Adderall and doing yeah, a line. That's, that's... Like it's based the same stuff happens. <sighs> Look, I'm I'm sober. Seven, over 17 years and I got prescribed Adderall for my ADHD. I took, I was only 10 milligrams and it calmed me down. I'm like, I can't take this. I just can't. Mm-hmm. I just, it's the feeling. I'm like, there's a big difference between Adderall cocaine and doing a double espresso. I try to tell people that, right? Yeah. Dude, coffee is not cocaine. Like it, there's no substitute. Adderall is meth based. 
Yeah. It's going to – like now I'm not – saying that some people don't need some Adderall but there's a big difference between doing 10 milligrams as prescribed and 150 milligrams three times a day and you're sitting online making money and doing stuff that's mm -hmm. come on dude yeah Adderall you've got to be very careful yeah. you've got to be very careful and even even great doctors say it should be used for a little bit of time and then weaned off mm -hmm. no. but you know there's a big shortage yeah because of all COVID the crackheads all that, yeah everyone's snorting it mm-hmm of course. It's interesting. I snorted it a few times years ago. There's only thing I haven't... Uh, I never did fentanyl. That wasn't around. And I never liked... I never shot anything. It was really weird. I had these like rules as a addict. Do you like uppers? Liked uppers, but I had a rule that I had to get to the gym every day and I wouldn't party past 5 o'clock. Very rarely I went past... It was fucking weird. I had the... Can't beat the sun up rule. I had to be home before the yeah, sun. Yeah, see? Because if there the sun go. was up, it was game over. My, I'm wrecked. Yeah. I'm tired. Mine was mostly the lack of sleep. If I just got the sun up, it was game over. Yes, but that's it. It's dangerous. So I could work hard, play hard, do massive amounts of like copious amounts of drugs, get mm -hmm. through it, sell shows, be on shows, get paid ridiculous amounts of money to, you Already. know, be in party scenes. And it's stupid. Yeah. It's like stupid. It's like, it's dumb. And us back in the real estate days when it was winning, we'd call you, yo, Mike, I need oh, a dude, table. Forget it. I got Done. 10 girls. Give me 10 bottles. Done. Put me by the DJ. Done. Yeah. All night and whatever you needed. Mm -hmm. And you were covered. That's why now I still get the calls. <laughs> hey, room, and I've still got the hookups. See, I wasn't ashamed of it. And that's why all my club friends still buy my books and hang out. Like, I'm not ashamed of it. It's like what I did. I just, well, let's talk about shame because. Most people want to hide their past. And you're like, no, I'm learning from this. I'm teaching from this. This is who I am. You're still that. It's not like you aren't that person. No. You're still that person. It's just not your, you know, super guiding light anymore. But what is it around shame that I believe if we start running around ashamed of our past, not bringing, avoiding it and running away from it, we almost end up right back like a slingshot into it. You know, instead it. of like taking ownership, you're not ashamed because you take ownership. You're just you're dishing it out like a comedian. And also like this was my life. This is who I am. I Just take it or leave it. Well, you know what it is? It's like we're so I think it starts with schooling, right? You're not allowed to fail. And if you failed, you put in an F or a D and you, you're told you can't make mistakes and you've got to conform and you've got to sit up this way and you've got to have approval. And then you go to families, right? You ashamed me. And you've got to like culturally fit in. Like I, I remember going out um, with my son to see a friend and he just wasn't in the fucking mood. And we're at this really nice restaurant and he wanted just, just wanted to sit in my arms. I was like, fine. Mm -hmm. And people are looking at me and I'm like, what are you looking at? It's my son. Like, I'm not ashamed. If he doesn't want to say hi to anyone, he's not going to say hi to anyone. So I grew up with like my parents would say, you should be ashamed of yourself. You should feel guilty. So you start feeling ashamed. Of you. you should feel ashamed of your success because my older brother was sick when we were growing up. Mm -hmm. So when I got in around people that I honestly thought had it together and they were fucking maniacs and fucked up and just completely like screwed up, I was like, it was like Wizard of Oz. I was like, whoa, it's all bullshit. Everyone's flawed. Mm -hmm. So I'm just... I just tell people I screw up all the time. I just make it amends. Um, I don't make disempowering choices because I'm not in my sympathetic nervous system. If if I come up short, I just say I come up short. I'm honest. Um, it's like the rule of thirds, right? It's like if I work really hard and a third of my money goes to my basic needs, but those basic needs aren't like I'm not comparing myself with someone else's basic needs. So I said to someone, why do you have a BMW? Like, I need that car. I'm like, well, that's transport. You can't afford it. Well, you know, I'm like, I know I don't know. Get a car that you can afford. Mm -hmm. Second part goes in educating myself and saving money, right? And using that money I save to invest in things. Part three of the rule of thirds is basically having a little fun and going on vacations, right? Within my spending limit. So if you take the rule of thirds, right, and you live within your means and, and you're, you're totally doing the right thing, and if I come up short or something comes up from the past and I'm honest about who I am now and I'm actually walking the talk, well, if someone calls me up and they said, do you remember doing this? And I don't. I'm like, I don't. Do I owe you amends? 
They're like, yeah, I'm like, talk about it. I had a guy hit me up from high school and said, you know, when we were growing up, you were mean to me. I was like, oh, okay, I don't even remember you. And I said, what do you need me to do? And he's just like, oh, I just can't believe you were so open about it. I said, yeah, let me send you a book. Then I called a friend of mine, I messaged a friend of mine who's going through hell, like three, three kids, four jobs, no baby daddy. And I was like, you know, do you remember this guy? She goes, I don't. I was like, was I ever mean to you? She goes, no, you were so nice. You were always nice to me. I said, okay. But I said, do you remember this guy? She goes, I don't even remember him. But like, okay, at least I made the amends. Mm -hmm. So if I fuck up, I just put my hand up. Because I, I grew around, grew up with people. And to this day, there's people that relatives that that will never put their hand up and never say they're sorry and never make an amends. Yeah, plus they blamed you. Blames me, so. right? And I just would rather say like i remember just recently my my mother had a, a, an incident with my um my brother's uh, my nephew right my brother's son and he's he was a little he was wasn't nice to her and i never had a relationship with my dad my mom's mom because my dad would make me fight her he just did, he resented her because he had to go to her for stuff and so here i am i'm four or five and my son's four or five and he has this beautiful relationship with my in-laws and i said you know remember when you used to make me scream at your mum? your mom said yeah wasn't it funny and i was like hold on if i rang my brother now and my nephew and said every time you see grandma can you just fucking scream at her and berate her would it be funny and she had an honest moment she's like oh man i never looked at it like that I was like, why do you think I was so twisted as a five-year-old fighting with everyone? Because you would make me fight with people and take no responsibility. So I was a psycho as a kid. Instigated, yeah. I was nuts. I would just fight with people, but they would prompt me, like, go do this, go do that. And you're a little kid. You're like, all right, let me just fight with people. So it's now because I went through that, I would just rather tell the truth. I'm flawed, yeah. but I work on it. I'm like, of course I'm flawed. I don't have, I don't have it figured out. I figure it out. None of us have it figured out. Nope. We have the opportunity to figure it out. Yeah, never have it figured out. And continue out. work on figuring it Every out. Every day. I just, even like when I pulled up, I was like trying to figure out, I was like, I don't know where the fuck I park. And then you went picking up, I'm like, I'll just I'll just wait and park here, I guess. I don't know. <laughs> I couldn't figure it out. I was like, I need help. Like, and you're like, oh, you park, cool, but let me check. I'm like, okay, cool. It's like, I know exactly. I was like, I don't know. Read the notes of the calendar invite. <laughs> yeah, but you know what I'm saying? It's just like, what the <laughs> fuck? Like, I don't know where I am. Um, so this has been amazing, but I have a question. Yeah. Do you remember the moment, the day, the time, what it looked like when you said, I have to stop this? Oh, yeah. And I need to become who you are now. A thousand percent. I've had, um, I have very good intuition and I've had pivotal moments. There's a, there's a movie that everyone should watch called Sliding Doors. It's old with Gwyneth Paltrow. And in the movie, she has her intuition guiding her and she follows her ego. And it shows both parts at the same time. Mm. It's old, but it's beautiful. It's really well done. Um, I was shooting a VH1 show and I was with Scott Weiland at the time. And I've actually spoken to Mary, his, uh, his ex. We've spoken about this. And um, we're, doing coke. we're doing a lot of coke. We were, we were two weeks after. We'd, we'd wrap shooting this pilot and the pilot was called Dive. It was about me owning a rock a bar with, you know, Scott Weiland and a bunch of legends. And I remember she was having a conversation with him on the phone and she put down, she was basically leaving with the kids. And um, I didn't have any kids. I didn't really give a fuck about anything. I was just living in the, in the, the madness I was it's living yellow. in. YOLO. Just out of my fucking mind. And I remember looking at him and I said, I guess oh, to me, it's just like, fuck, it's done, right? Like, and he's like, I'm Scott Weiland. I do what I want. And I pressed pause for the first time in my life and I zoomed out. And I'm like, it's not supposed to be like this. Mm. So I was like, you know what? I'm just going to get sober and see what happens. Now, I walked down the stairs, called a friend of mine. Um, fortunately, it, he was in the club business, but sober. And I'd been sober before at 19 and I'd made some mistakes earlier in my life. And I, I, went, I went with the wrong mentor at 19. And when I went with that wrong mentor, it was the whole thing coming back to me. When I went with that wrong mentor, 
he took advantage of a girl, okay? And we're at acting school and I couldn't do anything because I was hammered and we're all drunk. And the next day I pulled her aside and I was like, I know he took advantage of you. What do I do? And she's like, mm. don't, don't do anything. So I went to the acting dean and my, my linear thing was go to acting school. I went to the same school as Hugh Jackman. Was the actors, you know, you get an agent, you go to America. That was the path. I was like, I can't do that. So the dean said, look, it's your word against his. I said, well, I'll leave. Just say, say something and kick him out. I, she can't face that. She can't be treated like that. Yeah. So the crazy thing is I ended up getting a job in a clothing store on this, on this mall and a lady came into that clothing store when I was selling clothes and gave me a green card lottery ticket because I was telling I was coming to America and I won a fucking green card. Wow. Now, if I didn't do the right thing, I never would have got the green card. Mm -hmm. But the universe paid me back for taking care of that girl. Fast forward to Scott. I was like, I got to get sober. So I could have pushed the VH1 show. We're on the edge. But I stopped using and VH1 was like, well, you're a crackhead. You're the next Botaducci. It was the same time there was a the show called The Rock Life. Um, I think it was Flavor of Love, a lot of garbage. And then my show, which was this docky series. It was a really, it was expensive. It was really cool. So ironically, I get sober. Now, 17 years later, intervention started when I was doing that show. Mm -hmm. And now I'm getting people sober on intervention as an interventionist. Wow. I mean, you can't write that. But, but, but you're no, no. But you're still living that dream, the original dream. Yeah. Maybe you're not acting fictionally, but no, I'm doing. You're in but real I'm being life, of service. You're TV. Exactly. I'm being of service, and that's what it was about. Yeah. It's, it wasn't about me. It's about being of service. And if God gives me the ability to be able to interpret work, for example, mm -hmm. and then do the right work. Right, like so, I'm a I'm a great actor. If I had to play you, right, I get into your character and tell your story. That's my job. My job is to be of service to mm -hmm. the play and the character, not about me. I was all about fucking me. Yeah, and that changed. So, ha and but if I didn't have the skills, because it's all real interventions, it's real. But I've been on shows. I've done. I know how to work around, and I know what they need. Mm -hmm. So the crazy thing is, all that training made sense. Right? It was but all for that purpose. It was all that for purpose. I didn't think, like, come on, dude. You told Scott Weiland, and all that, I'm getting sober. Everyone laughs at you. Unfortunately, Scott is dead. Yeah. And he even died when I was detoxing someone. And now people call me. They're like, oh, Mike, crazy Mike that used to do Coke with us. So I always tell people, you know the right thing to do. You, everyone does. Mm -hmm. Everyone does at their core level. And it's hard to do it. Because yeah. you know what? You've got to have faith that the work you're doing now will land where it's supposed to land. But that's out of our hands. Mm -hmm. We've got to do the right work and let the results speak in time. That's the truth. And especially we listen to that voice. The voice is there. We choose to quiet it down. Yep. To shut it up. To look at all the other voices and like, that's the one I need to go there. No, it's right here. We There's know no shortcuts. And we're just, we're innately lazy. <laughs> and we don't want to be uncomfortable. So we choose the comfortable route. We choose the easy route, right? God, that's, that's why, you know, circling down, that, that's love or fear. Uh, absolutely. And I say we've got to choose love. People are like, like Nike, just do it. Choose love. But I always, it's not easy. It's so much easier to get mad and flick someone off. We talked earlier about the cutting off on the freeway. I give that example all the time because... You could lose your mind and just say, I hope you get a ticket and get into an accident or we could take a moment. Nobody got hurt. Cool. I hope you get there safe. Do you know, like I try to tell people, right? If you can be a loving, kind person and go out of your way, the, the miracle of like, I mean, I'll give you an example. Someone forged my name on a document and, and the IRS had sent me a bill, but I knew I didn't have the bill and it was COVID. And instead of being angry, I just was like, I couldn't get on the phone of the IRS, right? So I went, I go on blogs. I just gather information. And this, this woman had literally written up a way to hack the system. Don't press this number, press this, blah, blah, blah. I got on. So I said, okay, all I'm going to do is give myself time. I was on hold for like six hours. 
First thing I do is when I get on hold, because I've got to like, now I can get angry, pay the IRS bill or fight them, but I know it's not my bill. Someone had sent in the wrong tax return and said I'd made more money. The first thing I ask the person on the, on the phone is, how's your day going? Because they're going to get people abuse them in the IRS, right? On the mm -hmm. phone. The guy says, thank you so much for asking. I'm stage four cancer. Oof. Oof. I spent 30 minutes talking to him before we even talked about the tax bill. Because I'm not angry, right? That he said, let me look at your form. He's like, oh, they messed these things up. Resend it. But here's a direct line. Forms came from the IRS again. I worked my way through the system, even with the direct line. I get another person and I'm like, and I got his name. And I'm like, oh yeah, this is the direct line. How's your day going? She was going through something. Spent 20 minutes talking to her about her problems. Mm -hmm. I ended up, I logged the hours. 32 hours on hold with the IRS. Wow. 32 hours. That's over a day. On hold over time, right? Over like whatever it was, uh, six to eight months, just on hold. But because I went slow and I was kind and loving and compassionate, I didn't have to actually send in that 30 or 40 grand. I got money back because they realized someone had done the wrong, uh, they've sent in the wrong 1099s twice or three times. They contacted the company and made them redo their taxes. Now, if I'm an angry motherfucker that's full of fear, because what? I'm afraid I'm not going to get what I want. I'm going to lose what I have. I have guilt and shame for something. You don't I have the money the to pay it. Like, yeah, the right? whole shebang. Or I'm worried about the future. Four, four parts, right? Because you're always, you're in fear. But if I'm just in love and kind and I'm loving to the next person, then the universe just opens up the mm -hmm. flow. And then when shit comes in now, stop. Here's a, here's a technique that I talk about in my book that'll change. It saves people's lives. It's called stop. It's very simple. When you feel a disempowering emotion, you feel frustrated, you feel angry, you feel disturbed, you just stop. You say, I am disturbed. T, take a breath, but you breathe like I talk about in Storm. Breathe five, six, seven, eight, ten breaths diaphragmatically. Mm -hmm. O, observe. What is the disturbance? It's always, I'm, I'm afraid I'm not going to get a want, lose what I have, guilt and shame for the past, or worried about the future. Mm -hmm. Write it down. What's the next right action I can take, right? Write that down, take it, then P, proceed. If you get in the habit of regulating your sympathetic nervous system and you get back into rest and digest and you're calm, you can navigate life. Yeah. Those are powerful examples. I'm going to start doing that when I call on these calls. The, the best. The Always one ask. I don't ask because I'm heated by the time I'm there. But what I do always say is, look, I'm sorry if I come off with a tone. This has nothing to do with you. I'm just really frustrated about what's happening. I actually had a sales tax bill where they took 50K straight out my account. Total error on their end. But, like, I needed that for project. Like, this is a whole. But I'm like, this isn't about you. This is me being frustrated. Let me just put that all out on the table. So I'm apologizing in advance. And I, I don't curse when I get angry or any of that. I curse to, out of enjoyment and adjectives, right? So I do that, but I'm going to do that part now to that. Do you want me to so. teach you a trick about rapport? Yeah. Okay. So they know that they're getting attacked, right? So I'll teach you a trick, and everyone can use it. You, you own a car, right? Okay. What kind of car do you own? Uh, 63 Chevy. Perfect. I'm going to ask you... Simple, simple, simple question. Were you motivated to buy that car because you saw it? Did you hear about it or did you feel it? I've wanted an old classic car since I was a kid. But, Truck. But why? Did you see it first? Oh, yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. You saw it. After you saw it, before you bought that car, did you then go to look around for that, that specific car and then get in it and drive it to feel it? Or did you see it and you just knew? I saw it. I went on the spot, gave him cash, took it home. So you so you go for seeing first, then feeling. Okay, what should I trick, right? Have you seen 
that new diet pill that everyone's using and they're feeling good. Mm -hmm. Have you seen it? Well, there's Ozepic and there's, a, there's, there's a another one. Have you seen it? I don't think the other one. I, I've been reading on the Ozepic okay. stuff. If I sent taking. you some to sample and you like it, do you feel like you may like want to see it? Probably, of course. Ah, do you see what I said? Did you see it and feel it? Mm -hmm. I said seeing because I know you like to look at things and would you feel it? Would you take my sample? Yeah. Right? Yeah. Already you took it, right? Because you said straight away, so I've seen Zosempic, right? Because I know you saw it visually. When you get on the phone to someone, calm, ask them a question. How was your day? Next time you notice something, you talk about a wedding. All someone talks about food the whole time. Dude, the food was so amazing. You know they saw it through food. How was the restaurant? Where'd you eat? What do you like? Mm -hmm. Oh, I like that. Someone talks about music. I love the vibe. I love the sound, right? Someone talks about the fashion, right? You listen to how people saw information. If I listen to how you saw it on the phone, I am going to say, oh, I see what you're talking about. I hear what you're saying or I feel with what you see. I feel. It's got to be one of the three, right? Because mm -hmm, mm -hmm. you hear, I, I really don't see what you're talking about. I don't see what you're talking about. They don't say, I don't hear what you're talking I don't see it, right? Mm -hmm. Well, let me show you. So if you listen to say the way someone sorts, even on a phone, and you match their tone, mm -hmm. if they're up, talk up. If they're slow, slow down with them build mm -hmm. rapport and you match mirror and match their tone unconsciously they click and you know what i really like this guy unconsciously i'm gonna help them then if you're kind the rest of the day what do they get abuse they're on the phone they're bill collecting they're right but they remember that straight moment. away you're in because why this person actually cares and listens to me and wants to hear me i'm a human on this end too ah, it's a little report trick yeah and you do it all the time my wife even says you talk to him on the phone because she's like snappy when we go places we go to the airport i always get us upgrade or whatever she's like you talk to them because she's not i'm like hey how's the day going oh man you'll never believe no i won't believe tell me Always repeat back what they said. You'll never believe what I've gone through. I, 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 I know. I, I don't believe what you've gone through. Mm -hmm. Tell me. I want to hear what you've gone through. In the back of my mind, I want to get upgraded. And they go on and they go on and they go on. And like, look, what can I do for you today? Mm -hmm. I don't know. Do you have any extra seats? Or do you know, can you upgrade? You know what? I'm going to make it happen. <laughs> you know, if you can make it happen... I'd be awesome. If yeah. not, it's okay. But see what you can do. Maybe you can make it happen. Guess what? They make it happen. Yeah. Just from just doing the opposite. <laughs> what do they get? Anger. Yeah. I worked at club doors for years. People come in abusing me all night. It didn't matter who you were. If you came up nice and you could be dressed like, you know, with your paints on your thing, right? And you're like, oh, look, man, I just want to get in. I've got all these douchebags around me and the dress code could be opposite. I'm like, I'm taking care of this. I don't give a fuck. I'll let you in. Yeah. I would always let people, they're like, why'd you let me in? I'm like, because he's not a dick. Yeah. And then I'd become friends with the person and the person would be cool anyway. And they'd be like, I'm like, that. Yeah, Mike let him in. He's, that's his vibe. Do you see what I mean? So mm -hmm, that's a little mm -hmm. trick. It helps people. No, I like it. You just added a whole new level. Because as you see, I've got the mirror thing down. Yeah. You know, I lean in, I do the yeah. tone. And I learned that in early on with like sales and just human psychology. But you know the other stuff you tied in i see I, I don't see it right now oh let me show you because i'm going through some problems that i've been trying to have these other graphic designers someone help me with something and it's just not i'm like why isn't my feedback let me try it this way let me try it this way let me try it this way but now it's like wait they probably gave me the answer quicker and i didn't have to go through all these nice. rounds so it's just me being even more observant. It's so sorting. That, that's beautiful. Thank yeah, you. Yeah, it's sorting. It's listening to how someone sorts. Mm -hmm. And we're all, some are visual, some are feeling. So I'm, I'm visual, but I'm also auditory. I like to see it and then mm -hmm. hear it. Then I feel it. So if you tell me, you tell me, I'm like, show me. Show me. And I watch it. Right? And then I really watch it. And then I listen to the way you're doing it. And then I, and I see it in my... Like, and then I hear how would i do and then, and then boom 
even more and more at myself. Like I know I'm feeling a certain way, but I don't start from there. So even actually doing it to myself, it's I great. should be like, hey, I'm feeling this way. Let me just throw that out there. Yeah. And then you're already in in the energy of that instead yeah. of hiding it, hiding it. And no, because then, 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 then people could understand it. And then if I, if I say I'm feeling this and you say you're feeling that and then you're a visual person, right? I'll go, well, show me what you're feeling. Yeah. Then I'm like, I see what you're feeling, not like... Oh, well, I don't feel that. I don't, I, can you hear me? And you're like, person goes, I can't hear you. I'm trying to show you. It's, do you see what I'm saying? But it's, it's such yeah. a skill. And once you get good at it, like I do it with addicts all the time and interventions. Once I lock into their predicates mm -hmm. and how they, it's an NLP thing. I studied NLP. Yeah, oh, yeah. it's easy. Cause you just go, oh yeah, I got you. Yeah. Well, that's going to be great. This is going to be a great take. There's so much in this episode. Thank you for, for showing up, for being you, Mike. And, and if they want the book, here it is. I got you a copy of the book. Oh, you're going to have to sign it for of me. Course. We will link up the books. We will link up everything. The new book is called A Dose of Positivity. And dose is dopamine, oxytocin, serotonin, and endorphins. That's it. You got to find positive, empowering ways to get your dose. Yeah. Not disempowering. Yep. And that makes it. That makes it really easy. Because we think about the dose, the pill. Yeah. We all want the pill. So, okay, let's... What are empowering ways? Let's figure, figure out those. how to do it. Yeah. Yep. So final question. You ready? Yeah. Mike, how do you define living a life through love? Well, for me, you can't give love if you don't love yourself. So I always work on myself first, take responsibility for how I choose to think, how I choose to feel and how I choose to act. Um, and then I make sure I calm the inner critic that I'm kind to myself yeah. and by being kind to myself and you know being being a good person then i can put love out into the world yeah beautiful answer and that's truth and there, there's a thing that sticks out right there and, and, and i wanted to end it at that it's based on our conversation we've had let's observe how often people are not being kind to other people and just imagine what's their conversation in their head so don't take it personal. Like that's what just landed in that in that moment. It's like, wow, imagine how they talk to themselves. You know, it's a really important thing that I say. Um, if I see someone that's frustrated and or acting out, I give them love because I'll tell you why. I'm like, they're just not doing the work I'm doing. Maybe one day they will, maybe one day they won't. But mm -hmm. I'm going to give them a pass. I'm not going to get caught in the crosshairs. I don't know where they're coming from. Right, and what they've been through. I don't know where they're going, mm -hmm. but I'm just going to give them a pass and play the matter at all, let the bull pass and smile and be just, it's all good. I'm not yeah. gonna, it's not on me, man. It's on you. It's okay. Also, when you give love in those moments, that's actually truly giving love. It's yeah. not the flowers when everyone's no. happy and rosy. That's easy. It's Real like love. when you're having a bad time, we're having conflict, we're having everything. You know what? As hard as it is, let me lean in with love. Yeah, but it's better anyway. Yeah. Life is too short to be a fucking psycho, just Nazi asshole. Yeah. Like, it's just, it's pointless. It goes nowhere. No. It's toxic. Choose love. Yep. And where can everybody find you? The Mike underscore diamond um, on all social media. And my website is themikediamond.com. There can only be one. Try to be. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks for having me. Thank you so much for tuning in to Live Through Love. If you love this episode, you'll love this episode.